Kate has moved. Anybody to second? Second. second. You can have it. Gary. On it. <laughs> Gary has second to approve the agenda as published. Any discussion? Okay, thank you. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the agenda as published, please signify by saying yes. Those opposed, please signify by saying no. Did I do that wrong? Did I? Aye. 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 My face is red. The motion to approve the published agenda is passed. <laughs> is there anybody who wishes to participate to address the board relative to any item at this time? Okay. Um, and Chris, you want to start with recognitions and thank yous? Yeah, sure. Actually, we have um, this last week was actually National School Counselors Week, so we got a chance to celebrate our wonderful counselors in the district. As we know, they serve in many, many roles, and we just want to thank them for all the services they provide, not only to our students, but many of our families within the district. Um, this week is National FCCLA, Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America Week, and also it is our Bus Driver Recognition Week. So we are celebrating them in... Um, definitely our bus drivers as they're getting all of our kids everywhere safe in this weather and um, and then uh, and celebrating them um, this week and then next week is National FFA week and so each year our future farmer of America chapters around the country celebrate this week and the week-long tradition began back in 1947 and um, that so they'll have many different activities at the high school like they do and be celebrating the FFA Thank you. Um, on to reports and discussion. Project Bridge from Lynn Wilson and students. Come on up. <coughs> and this is not on a consent to agenda item. Okay. So we have a little slideshow. Um, we basically just want to um, thank the board for. This is year three for Project Bridge. So um, if you want, we have a, just a slideshow of things that we've done this year. Um, there's how do I make it not go into the slideshow? <laughs> it may not, you may have to just click through or whatever. Oh, okay. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, we are one of the three transition programs that we have here in Holman. Um, we do a lot of different community experiences, work on career development, work on um, daily living activities, and we try and get our students some different work experiences. Um, I am Lynn Wilson. I'm the one that started this program, and Stacy Novi back here is my educational assistant. Um, <coughs> one thing that we've added a lot this year is collaboration um, with different classes. And you'll see in some of the slides some of the cool things that we are doing. We work on, we have to actually work on rec leisure activities. Um, I know that kind of sounds funny, but a lot of our students are very focused on certain things and we have to work on social interaction and just relaxing and playing board games and, and interacting that way. Um, so here we're playing cards or um, connect four, just chilling with our friends. Um, we, of course, participate in the homecoming activities. Um, all of our students are in the football game, which is amazing if you haven't been to it yet. Um, and we, the high school, I think we were the 70s for the theme yeah. this year, so we had to do some shopping, if you can see. Um, and then we handed out candy and stickers and all that fun stuff in the parade. We do a lot of um, daily living skills, baking, cooking, measurement, um, things like that. Um, we also practice ordering food, table manners, things that you would need to do in a restaurant. We go to Special Festers. Um, this was a former student that we got to meet up with at Special Festers, so very exciting. See them out in the community. Um, Pickle Ranch is an awesome place if you need pumpkins or gourds or haystacks. It's out on Bryce Prairie and they are wonderful. They donate all the stuff for our community Thanksgiving lunch. And they have over a hundred chickens. So the kids get to feed the chickens and they love it. 
Um, and then we serve the community and our board members and um, any principals, things that could make it out there. We do all of the cooking um, ahead of time. So I think the Monday before th that Tuesday when we serve it, we make eight to 10 pumpkin pies and um, peel lots of pounds of potatoes. Um, and then our students all have to rotate um, stations and they serve um, the community the, the food and they clean up. We also, this year we're volunteering at TJ Maxx, which is a new experience for some of our students. Um, it's great in the back area. We do a lot of the flat folding and the prep work to get things out on the floor and the, the staff at TJ Maxx have been wonderful to accommodate our different needs that we have this year. Um, and this year we've started something new with um, Ms. Krakowski's class. We have had the Triumph Card Company, which you've all seen in your schools. Um, but we're, we're amping it up a little bit. Um, if you get this, um, Stacy, do you know if they'll get like this, a copy of this at all? Because this merged card company actually has our website, which we now have an actual website to the card company. And we've changed it to merge, which means we're merging Project Bridge and Risk to Resilience, which is Miss G's class, um, into this new card company. And we are expanding it and we um, have the website, like I said, so we're hoping that, that we can go bigger. Um, so this is actually the link to our, our um, website. Um, and we work a lot with our students. We make um, different kinds of greeting cards. Thank you, sympathy, birthday, um, get well, um, blank ones. So we get a lot of different ones made. So we've worked on a lot of her students helping our students um, putting parts of the cards together. And it kind of looks like an assembly line, which is the easiest way to make the cards. Um, we also go to UWL and for adaptive PE things and do the rock walls and the flying squirrels and all that fun <coughs> stuff, right, Sam? <laughs> yeah. Um, we joined Miss G's class and we made um, a blanket and then they brought like 40 some blankets to the Ronald McDonald house, served the meals and each room got a, a blanket. So we helped um, do a tie blanket with them. And our big thing for this year is we have a community Valentine's dance, which is this Thursday. Um, it, it grows a little more every year. So we're um, up to 15 districts that we've invited, special ed high school classes. Um, we've actually had a response of just over 200 that are coming to this dance. Mm -hmm. And then we open it up to our high school teachers to bring their advisories or their second hour classes um, for 15, 20 minutes and, and, and dance with these students. They just love it when their peers come and, and hang out with them in their setting. Um, so you guys are also invited. It is this Thursday from 9 to 11 in the morning and it's in Jim C. Sam, would you come help me? So you are each getting a sample of our Valentine cards that we've made. And um, we hope that you come to our dance. We will have, we have made, at the moment, 15 dozen sugar cookies. 15. Mm -hmm. Very nice of you. And that's all we have. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jay and Janice, are you going to follow up with the health insurance options now? <laughs> Hoping we follow that. No. <laughs> I hope they have cards wow. for us. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for them, but I don't Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You still want to ask? That's so awesome. Yeah, I do. Hey, Lynn. 
Um, Tom has a question. I'm sorry. Just how many uh, businesses are you are you uh, coordinating with? Are you expanding that as far as the adult down the road, getting jobs and stuff? I'm just curious. How is that something that you're moving on with other other? Yeah, I mean, like for employment down the road. Yeah, that's a big question what's what's if you had anything on a wish list what's the one thing you would like to have better from our district that help you it's a tough question maybe yeah I think you're doing a great job. Thank you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Health insurance options with Jay and Janice. And Julie's and joining Julie, us. Julie, hi. Yeah, not Sorry. To be left out. <laughs> uh, so here we are again. This is an annual event for us. Uh, we've been working for, I want to say, a month and a half um, trying to get data collected and create a foundation for making decisions for the upcoming year's health insurance plan renewal. And if you look at this slide, it um, is an illustration of some of the events that will take place. I'm going to start at the far right because our plan year, remember, starts on July 1st, each year renewing on July 1st. Okay, so jump back all the way to the other end. Uh, we missed the employee relations team that was uh, actually canceled but rescheduled, so um, we've reinserted that on the, uh, it's the third, the yellow dot. We're here tonight, that's the green dot, talking to you about the plan designs update for this upcoming year. Uh, we'll also meet with the wellness committee, the personnel and governance committee. We won't have renewal rates until sometime in late March. Um, that will be an important decision. Uh, Julie and I were reviewing the budget input variables uh, earlier today, and the budget input variable calls for a 3% health insurance premium increase. And if you know anything about medical trend, that's, we're gonna have to work hard uh, to make that happen. Um, but there's some good news on some things that have been happening. Uh, what we don't wanna have happen is get to that renewal time and then be scrambling for what's our best option if the renewal rates come in above. So we're doing all this work in advance to evaluate options um, so we're prepared and in the best decision uh, to make a, de uh, a determination, recommendation of the board at that point. So that's our timeline. Uh, just a brief history. This is in your board packet, board materials. Um, if you um, don't remember our history, we've had a very active history when it comes to health insurance. This is not something we just let happen. Um, this shows back to 2013 14 shows how we introduced multiple plans, even at one point in time having three plans as we transition to a higher deductible health insurance plan, uh, continuing with three plans in 2016-17. In 2017-18, remember plan two was experiencing such high claims costs versus premiums going in. We actually went down to two plans in 2017-18, and then for this year, we were down to one plan. And what happened to plan two, two years ago, actually happened to plan three last year. And so plan 2018-19, uh, we had the one plan design. As you know, the premiums that we'll pay in the upcoming year are highly dependent upon the claims to premium ratio or loss ratio that we experienced in the prior year. This takes history, and not by plan year, but look at it in terms of the calendar year, because they're still playing claims right now on December services that employees received. So this always trails a bit. Um, but you can see here uh, what's happened in terms of the, our history with premiums and claims. 
and loss ratio. And Janice, I think I've used in the past like a 91 or 92 percent is what they consider an acceptable loss ratio. The nine to eight, eight to nine percent is really to cover the processing costs associated with the insurance plan and to pay other overhead associated with um, offering the insurance plan. So in some years, we had a very unfavorable loss ratio, 105%, you can see back in 2013. Um, but in other years, we've had more favorable. We put together a summary slide on this. You'll see it in a couple minutes. Um, but that's the raw data if you want to go back and look at it. A little bit more detail on uh, 2018 uh, calendar year. Remember, um, from January through June of 2018, we were still on the previous plan year where we had plan three available. That ended at the end of June. So you can see the loss ratio that there was at that time. That plan was not sustainable. There was 175, pardon me, 174 percent loss ratio. They paid out $174 in claims on every $100 paid in. They just can't sustain a plan under that model. And you can look at our plan four, and you can see that uh, in the first half of the calendar year, January through June, that was operating at about a 74% loss ratio, which would be very favorable if the target was 91%. Um, you can see then um, how that fared in the second half of the year, but there's a note here. And Janice, would you talk about that note on the bottom of the page? Sure. Uh, the claims data that I received uh, from UMR is through claims that were paid through January 24th, and there's always a lag time involved from the, uh, when the claims are actually submitted by various providers. And the last quarter of the year, there's typically always a, a greater lag time just because the carriers, uh, the volume of services at the end of the year typically is ex higher than normal, so there's always a greater time. And then there's always uh, a larger claim, potentially, that is out there that has not even uh, been submitted uh, to the uh, UMR at this time. So we know that there's at least one large claim that is out there that hasn't even hit the numbers yet. So when I looked at these numbers, I started digging into them in more detail, and I made some phone calls because I just was concerned that it looked really too good knowing some of the medical conditions that I'm aware of within the district. So we were really kind of excited when we were first looking at the raw, raw data. Janice said, whoa, 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 let's wait a minute here. And so we'll have to wait until we see uh, what those claims that are delayed claims uh, come in at. And that's one of the reasons why we wait until, well, they need until March to process what our premium increases will be, because they too are still waiting on these they being the insurance company. So the, this is the summary slide. Um, total claims uh, this year, although with that asterisk of things not coming in, are actually the lowest we've had in the last six years, which is really quite um, amazing, considering um, what medical inflation trend is, that we actually have less in claims now than we have in prior years. Um, the prior year low uh, was 4,450,000 in 2016 compared to the just over 4 million with an asterisk uh, right now. Um, this has resulted in lower premiums, that is our lower claims over time has resulted in lower premiums costs as well as our plan design changes. Um, $5,363,000 in premiums paid in 2018, there's only one year that was lower than that, and that was in 2017. So this year, imagine that, this year the lowest, second lowest of the last six years. So this is effective um, health insurance plan design. Um, plan number three, remember, was eliminated uh, July 1st of 2018. Uh, the loss ratio, as I pointed out, was 174 percent, and that was not sustainable. Uh, the current plan loss ratio at 12 months is 66 percent, asterisk, uh, but it is operating at a favorable loss ratio, and um, even knowing that we have some high-cost claims that are out there, it'd be um, difficult to imagine this uh, crossing over that 91 percent. Uh, we keep hoping for that. 
Um, total loss ratio for 12 months is 75% uh, combining both of the plans in 2018. So that's information on our loss ratio. Again, uh, a big factor in determining what our premium rates will be in the next year. Uh, we're also looking at comparative data uh, right now. You could say competitive data. These are the school districts with whom we compete uh, for employees. Um, and we're looking at their health plan designs uh, and these primary features of those. Uh, this is the Mississippi Valley Conference plus three school districts. The three school districts being GET, Melrose, Mondoro, and West Salem. Uh, while they're not equal in size to us, they are geographically proximate to us. And therefore, whether it be a teacher or a custodian or a uh, administrator, um, we are competing with these school districts to uh, attract employees and to retain our own. Uh, there are the other three school districts. You can see some have one plan offering. Uh, others have multiple plan offerings. I want to go back for just a moment to on Alaska. You see that their uh, plan includes an HMO, and that is unique amongst the school districts in the area. They are the only one uh, with an HMO plan design. Uh, we're also looking at private sector comparables. It's uh, responsible to look at what's going on in the private sector. And for some of our employees, we compete with the private sector. So again, a custodian, um, an administrative assistant, uh, those are individuals who we compete with uh, private sector employers as well. So we're uh, looking at those. These are um, all in the neighborhood. Uh, we'd call them larger employers. Uh, so you can see the top of the page, each column says how many covered employees or eligible employees they have. Uh, we didn't want to pick an employer with 50 and we didn't want to pick an employer with 3,000. Uh, sometimes there's volume uh, of covered lives that affect the plan. Now you can see at the top the plan design, many of those are HMOs. And uh, when I talk about in summary here, um, I'll mention that. So in summary of the last uh, three slides, four slides you looked at. When we compare ourselves to Mississippi Valley Conference plus three school districts, excluding the one that's an HMO plan, which is uh, a different kind of animal, apples and oranges, um, zero out of the eight offer a lower deductible than Holman's. So in terms of attracting employees, nobody offers a lower deductible than we do. Um, three of the eight have deductibles more than double Holman's deductible. Uh, one of the eight districts offers an HRA or HSA type benefit higher than Holman's. That means that there's only one person that offers a higher uh, HRA, HSA. Uh, four of the eight offer a higher coinsurance benefit. So we're right in the middle of the pack on that, right? Some pay uh, higher, some a little bit lower. I think there was one school district, Melrose Mindoro. No. I think there was one that pays 100% coinsurance uh, down to 80 percent. That was Melrose? Yes. Yeah. Um, four of the eight uh, pay 80 percent, uh, 80 to 85 percent of the premium. That is the employer pays 80 to 85 percent. The employee pays the remaining balance uh, towards the premium. Coleman's paying 85 percent. Uh, Melrose Mindoro pays 100 percent. On Alaska pays 80 comparatively. So there's not a huge range in that. It is a little odd to have a school district paying 100% of the premium. Uh, maybe an outlier. Um, five of the eight offer a lower maximum out of pocket than Holman's 3,500 single and 7,000 family. And then in summary, there's some private sector comparables there. Again, the HMOs are much more predominant in the private sector, 67% uh, versus 10% in the MVC. The employees pay a larger portion of the premium, average paying 33% to the single and 51% of a family health insurance plan in the private sector. That's, those are just averages versus Holman's 15. Uh, Non-HMO plans have much higher deductibles, more than two times those of home, so those that do offer non-HMO, um, the deductibles are quite high. And maximum amount of ex pocket exposures range from $500 to $5,000 more 
Ben Horowitz. So uh, recommendations for future plan design. Um, I guess as our starting point, we'd recommend maintaining the status quo with the health insurance plan design. I think we have a competitive plan, um, yet we have controlled cost uh, in recent years. In fact, in some ways lowered cost in recent years. Um, so those are all signs that the plan is working. However, as I said, and you see on the bottom right hand corner, we don't know what the total monthly premium will be. And we have a budget that we've set, which we plan to deliver on. And to do that, we need to be prepared. And so what I've developed uh, with the help of Janice and Julie is uh, a few options uh, for us to consider. Um, and those are the changes outlined in red there. Now I will give you before you leave tonight, I've printed out just this page you can refer to the rest of the slides. Um, it's in color. It's expensive to print. I just thought this one page might serve you well if you took it home with you tonight. So I have it printed. I'll pass it out after we're done. But um, you can see uh, changes in the deductible, um, both single and family. Uh, looking at a change to the uh, primary care visit uh, deductible the deductible was the same and increase the matching out of pocket. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then looking at some changes to uh, how we charge for uh, MRI, CT, and PET scans. Um, and then looking at potentially changing, uh, not the dollar amount, um, but how we, um, how an employee receives uh, the HSA contribution. So under the current plan, let's look at the single model. The employee receives a $750 HSA contribution for signing up for the single plan, and they're eligible to receive another $750 fulfilling the requirements of the wellness program. Um, one thing to look at would be to have $500 be associated with the uh, enrollment in the health insurance plan, that's $250 less, but tie that additional, move that $250 to be part of participating in the wellness initiatives. And then I put what the premiums would need to be if we were to reach that budget target of 3%. So why would we even consider these changes? Well, first is economic. But uh, whenever we look at changes, we ask ourselves, are the changes helping to honor the direction we want for our health insurance plan? And the first thing is the promotion of wellness. Uh, we realize that wellness is important. Healthy staff enjoy a fuller life, both personally and professionally. Um, it typically results in less leave time, which is advantageous to the students and the district. They enjoy a more full retirement because they're healthier when they do retire. And it lowers the health care costs, not just for the school district, but for the employee. Um, we want to continue to promote consumerism, that is value-driven choices. For example, going to the neighborhood family clinic, uh, which offers quality care, but at a lower cost to the employee and to the plan. Um, emergency rooms going to the clinic rather than to emergency rooms is another example, or using generic prescription drugs when possible as opposed to specialty uh, drugs. Those would be all examples of consumerism. And then we want to promote value-driven provider care. The reality is that some of the providers provide the services at a much lower cost. One example is this new, it's not a clinic, in West Salem. It will be a clinic, uh, but it's also going to be a, an MRI CT scan facility, and there will be a clinic uh, as a part of that. But it will be, you want me to go ahead and tell yeah, us? Yeah, okay. talk about that All right. program. Um, Dr. Ted Thompson, who is in the one who organized and built the Neighborhood Family Clinic, is going to be involved with it. He'll actually be the medical director at the new clinic, and they will be offering MRI and CT scan services at a much lower cost than our two big providers in our area. And for the district employees that are covered under the WCA Group Health Trust Plan, 
if they show their ID card, then those services there will still be covered at 100% like they are currently at the neighborhood family clinic and the community care clinic. So someone that doesn't have that connection with WCA would pay $500 for an MRI in our market with our two big providers. An MRI can run anywhere between 3,000 to 6,000, which is a direct impact on the members and also on the group overall with their claims and utilization. So this will be a real nice new benefit that will be added. Uh, they're anticipating the clinic will be open uh, by May. So we certainly want to provide education to the employees and their family members to utilize that facility at much lower cost for them as well. So this is not about lesser services or lesser quality services. The reality is that this company which will now be offering <coughs> services in our area, which has a nationally solid reputation, will do the same service for $500 that if the employee exercises a different choice will cost $3,000 or $4,000. That's what value-driven provider care suggests and consumerism. So, um, Yeah, this is neighborhood family clinic. Yeah, yeah. So if we look at the changes that were in red, I'm not going to read through all these details, but I think it's important that we disclose what the changes would be and why they would be considered and tying these back to wellness, uh, consumerism, and value-driven provider care. So the first would be the um, higher out-of-pocket exposure, um, increasing the maximum amount of pocket benefit uh, for in and out-of-network services, increasing members' co-insurance responsibilities and member responsibilities for a $500 copay for non-emergency MRIs. The idea of this quality care isn't if you need an emergency MRI, wait a minute, we're going to load you up, we're going to take it. That's not the idea. Um, uh, urgency uh, would always trump the value driven. You've got to get the care when you need it. Uh, but just trying to introduce those concepts into the health insurance plan uh, if we do need to make some changes. Janice, anything on that? Uh, number two is to modify the current plan with lower uh, in network co insurance. Um, when member does consider quality but lower cost services. And this gets into the neighborhood family clinic, the community care clinic, 100% of the deductible and 100% of the co-insurance is waived for the employee. And we can do that and still end up with lower claims costs just because the services are that much less expensive uh, at those points. Janice, any highlights on that? I would just, with the relationship with the uh, WCA, which is the carrier with the district and with the two clinics that are not connected with either the Mayo system or Gunderson, again, if the members go there for services, they're covered at 100% versus meeting deductible and out-of-pocket exposure. And then the key thing I think there is, is quality care. I use those clinics myself. Um, and the other thing, it helps preserve their HSA accounts. So they're not having that deductible and out-of-pocket exposure. So an employee can preserve the HSA dollars that the district contributes each year and then those employees that elect to put their own dollars in. So I think that's a true value as they can build that account and then still have those services at no cost. <clears throat> and there's plenty of opportunity here. Remember the uh, total claims for a year are over $4 million. And you can see here the amount of the claims that we're incurring at the neighborhood family clinic. So there's, there's room for more migration to them as a provider. Um, when we look at our uh, plan cost under prescriptions, um, we notice that there are some specialty um, drugs um, that are really the largest portion of our total claims. And um, specialty drugs in some cases, cases are a necessity and others uh, they're not. Um, what we've also found is that um, of the 7 o'clock, that is, they advertise at 7 o'clock, 7 to 9 uh, on TV every night, those would be some of the specialty drugs. And uh, what they've done is um, to help 
the individual choose the specialty drug, they are providing um, coupons and manufacturer discounts which shelter the individual from the coinsurance and the co-pays. Co-pay, deductible and coinsurance. Thank you, You're Janice. Um, as a result, the individual quickly moves through that portion of the plan and everything's covered at 100%. And then the prescription drug provider stops providing coupons and discounts once the insurance plan is paying for it. Um, so it really eliminates this idea of consumerism altogether because I never have to have any skin in the game on the front end. Um, so when it's not necessitated, because sometimes someone does need to take the special due. When it's not necessitated, we are looking at eliminating, counting the coupon and the discounts against the deductible. So if the pharmaceutical company wants to keep paying the deductible, they can keep paying that. We're just never going to count their dis discount and coupons to the deductible. So that's a another way of promoting um, cost effectiveness uh, value driven and um, consumerism Janice would you give this one a shot sure uh, <laughs> uh, one of the proposed is to expand the generic preventive therapy drug list um, under the current plan there's an abbreviated list that is a part of the group health insurance plan and there is a more extensive list that is available um, that would expand the preventative in nature so there and under the affordable care act when you have a high deductible health plan that is hsa qualified which your plan is here there are certain prescriptions that can be included and there are certain prescriptions that has to be excluded so it has to be <coughs> identified as being preventative in nature. So anything that you would read under the ACA rules, it indicates what category that particular prescription has to fall under to keep your plan in compliance. So we did evaluate and look at the more extensive list. And Jay and I have gone back and forth on this quite a bit in our discussions. Uh, the one thing, there's pros and cons uh, with it. If you expand the list, will that particular member take advantage of just taking more medications and not trying to make some adjustments in their lifestyle choices um, instead of taking another prescription so that is one thing the second thing is if they are free or more affordable for that particular member will it maybe stop a medical condition from progressing into a more costly more advanced medical state um, one thing I have found for some of my clients that have gone to a more extended list is that when a member looks at the list and sees that their particular medication is not on there, they will sit down and have a conversation with their physician and ask if their medication can be switched to that, which typically, first of all, it's going to be a lower cost prescription, which would be a win-win for the, when you compare the claims overall for the whole group. So there's pros and cons to it, um, and it's really a something that we've, Jay and I have had some pretty good discussions about, um, correct? Yes, we have. <laughs> uh, so that is one thing that uh, we could certainly do as far as evaluating really what the impact would be, not only from a cost perspective for the plan, but also the impact on the employees and their family members that could take advantage of that lower cost or no cost benefit. We'll keep talking about that one. Um, there are some good things about that. Um.
we'll include something in a recommendation. Uh, maternity care for mothers would be covered at 100% uh, after the deductible. That's one thing we're examining. The idea is that there'll be potential savings to the family, the mother, up to $4,000 in coinsurance. Um, removes a financial burden that uh, may um, deter people from uh, prenatal care uh, and promotes healthier outcomes following the pregnancy for mom and baby um, and potentially less work time missed uh, if everybody is healthier. Um, so uh, that's another option we're considering. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, we've been in some ways touched upon all of these. This is a summary of some of the reasons why we'd be uh, making the changes and the impact we would hope for. Uh, this has not been updated. This is something that we provide to the board with our final uh, recommendation. What's the year-on-year -year employee estimated cost implications of the health care plan design changes we make? This illustrates what we were presenting last year that would be updated uh, in our final recommendation. Uh, and this is what's the renewal's impact on the school district. So the prior slide, what's the impact on the employee? Uh, and this being what's the impact on the school district. Those will be updated in our final presentation. So we're hard at work um, trying to um, achieve the performance goals that we have. Workforce, right? We want to attract and retain. And fiscal, we want to be responsible and trying to find the proper balance for us in those two worlds. Janice, Julie, did I? Good? <laughs> I think so. everybody's I've, thinking uh, snow. I remember at the beginning in the Finance Committee, I know you guys have worked really hard on this, and it is a touchy subject, and I appreciate the little story, because I know it's, it's a real personal journey for a lot of people, and it's, we're not all uh, given good health, we have challenges, so I think you're doing a great job. Yep, it's important that we be there for people when that happens. Anybody else have any other questions? Kate? Yeah, I do have some. A couple you answered, and I appreciate that, like what makes an emergency or whatever. I, I wondered as I read this, and I um, I made my color copy of what you're going to give us, aren't I? <laughs> I've got mine, so I don't need that. Um, when, it, when it says in the language, like in number one, when the member doesn't consider quality lower costs, so I wondered what what does that look like? Is there proof that consideration was made? Are there bullet points under what must be considered? Um, and I see that, that that word consider is on number two also. I just, if you would just explain that to me, like, are there steps that, if it's me that is working for you when I go to make a claim or whatever that I have to show I did consider and this is why I did not. Oh. I, it seemed nebulous to me. Sure. Well, or maybe we were, it isn't. So. No, I, I can help you with it. Thank um, you. I'll try to help you clarify it. What we were looking at is when Jay mentioned that the utilization at the Neighborhood Family Clinic and Community Care Clinic is really low in relationship right. to the overall claims for the district. And certainly there's potential to increase uh, awareness and communication to all the employees and their family members. So when we looked at making a plan modification, uh, that alternative, and that shows that we would reduce the co-insurance from 90% to 80% for um, primary care office visits and also urgent care is because those services can be done at the neighborhood family clinic and the community care clinic. So, and that's the reason we are trying to build in some type of an incentive to encourage employees and their family members to utilize those facilities. It's not only cost driven, but also it's much more convenient. Uh, if anybody has ever sat in urgent care, it can be a pretty lengthy process and urgent care just to occupy rooms running about $220 in our market. The neighborhood family clinic and the community care clinic charge $39 for an office visit, and you can make an appointment or they take walk-ins. So it, I think we just need to make sure that there's more and more employees and their family members aware of those choices. Uh, you know, we try to encourage that throughout the open enrollment meetings, but <clears throat> not everybody attends them, and that message doesn't always get delivered home as well. So that's what we're kind of looking at is that there are some really good alternatives available, but if they elect um, to choose a facility that has a higher cost, 
then that member would pay 10% more than, actually would, they would pay 10% more because it would be from 90, 10 to 80, 20. Except that they're sheltered if they get to the maximum out of power. That's correct, absolutely. Okay, I, thank you. And, I, and you know, I, I think I do understand all that you said about the, the cost, but what I'm asking, I think, is this, this plan, if, if, and these are recommended, I see, when it comes in, it, we're asking people to go to the neighborhood clinic first, do that, and if they don't, this is the penalty they pay. And so is that what consider means? Uh, in that case, it means yes, your yes. choice. Yep, absolutely. It's your if, choice. If you, if, you, if you feel that you want to go somewhere other than the neighborhood, we're not going to stop, and you're not right. able to be covered. But right now, they don't have that. Is that correct? Is that a major change? Um, there to say, and I'm not maybe even saying urgent care. I, th I think a lot of people, I don't know, I could be wrong. I'd, I'd want to know how many of our people do that are well-versed in knowing about urgent care and not going to emergency like they used to but this seems like it, it this is this is something we do this we want you to do this that's how you'll get paid and if you don't you won't anymore is that correct it'll still get paid if they go but, elect not to go to the clinics it's just the deductibles are the same it, so they have the same upfront deductible exposure as the current plan. Right. It's just that the plan, instead of picking up 90% in network, it would pick up 80%. So the member would have an additional 10% exposure okay. if they Thanks. elected to utilize a facility that didn't offer that particular benefit. Got it. Thank yeah. you. But you could, no, that can ahead. be stated any number of ways. And so, yes, you could say it's a penalty. Um, you could say it's the consequences of one's choices. You could say it's a consideration. You could say, yeah, so I won't hide behind whatever word. If this change would be made, I know some employee will come to me and say, so you're penalizing me for my choice. I'm saying I, the health insurance plan is something we all pay for, mm -hmm. employees and employers. And if people want to elect richer services, more expensive services, then they should share in that at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. And um, so, Yes, wordsmithing, right. and but I, w I wouldn't in any way try to hide from employees that's what's happening. That's, yeah, that's good. I'm not arguing one way or the other. It just seemed to me to be a little unclear. Sure. Um, so, so I see little individual things like uh, babies reoccurring ear infections, and, and the same doctor has been working with that baby for the same amount of time. Um, it, and they and they choose to go back to that doctor as opposed to and I think also locations for neighborhood family clinic is it am I leaving any out I had I found Viroqua on Alaska Winona Sparta and La Crosse is that what you have also that is correct they are going to be building a new facility between on Alaska and Holman cool all and right. then they also the one in West Salem all right so where I'm going with this is if a doctor and a patient want to maintain and that's a critical kind of thing that mm -hmm. they go back to that is that a do they still get that 10% penalty if they opt to go there and and let's say not and and you know what that isn't even something you need to answer tonight but I'm thinking of those kind of things where the where the client our our staff members fully understand and do all these choices whenever they can but will exceptions be made I guess I would want that maybe answered sure. some other night because we don't need to stay here forever <laughs> with that but I just thought about Thank those you. things we can get uh, a breakdown of what types of services fall between primary and specialty because if you'll notice the specialty is still at 90 percent yeah and so there are certain types of medical professionals that fall under that professional uh the specialty care which okay. is not part of that because we want to make sure that specialty care is driven to where they have a relationship right good thank you i think that's it that helps a lot anybody else have any questions yeah. Thank you okay. for those uh, questions. ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Julie gets to stay sitting there and oh. talk about the WIAA <laughs> tournament receipts. I do. And Mark's going to join her. I just heard that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sit up Mark at the table <laughs> for support. <laughs> So there isn't a presentation on this. There's just the issue paper that was in your Google Drive. Um, just going to give you a little background on how tournament admissions uh, are handled in the home and school district. Um, when, and you can pipe in at any time, Mark. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, when the district hosts um, WIAA tournament events, like um, regionals or sectional events, um, and the district has the expenses of officials and um, utilities or extra duty, event manager, ticket taker, clock um, operator, things like that. Um, we are allowed to retain a certain percentage um, of the admissions and then WIA gets a cut of the dollars that come through the door when we host those events. Um, so every time we have an event, Mark fills out a WIAA financial statement, and the percentage actually changes depending on the event. For example, football, which brings in quite a bit more money through the gate, they get a bigger cut of. Um, but I guess it's win-win sort of because the district also keeps um, quite a bit of money when we host a football tournament. Um, so more recently, we came across language that DPI um, allows the district to deposit the profit of these events into the gift account. Historically, we have been depositing the admissions all, like 100%, into the gift account. And then um, from there, we pay WIA their portion, but retain the admissions in the co-curricular gift. Um, really, what's only allowed to be put in there is the profit first paying back the district for the expenses that the district incurs to host. Those are identified again in the first paragraph. And then DPI does allow the profit to go into the gift account. Um, in order to do that, we need to gain board approval. So that's why we are here tonight to ask for your approval um, going forward to deposit the receipts that are uh, profit for hosting WIA tournament events into the gift account co-curricular uh, if you recall, Gift 21 funds do carry over, so that allows um, Mark and his co-curricular booster um, group to make determination on how those profits will be used in the future. It also allows him, um, to, to, since they carry over, he could save for larger purchases for co-curricular events. Um, but again, WI, or DPI requires uh, board approval for us to go forward um, doing that rather than putting them all, for example, into the general fund. So if, do you, I'm, first I'll just open up for questions because that was kind of a lot. <laughs> that, what does that do to the amount that full curriculum would be getting previously, if they were getting? Sure. So previously they um, received 100%, so it was not offsetting the district cost, um, and it was all going into the gift account. So we've looked at that and we've analyzed the last four years of average receipts um, and how that would be impacted with this change where first the district would get its, um, they call it reimbursable expenses and then the cost for officiating. Um, and then like how that would change going forward and how that would impact um, Mark and his budget. And it's an average between Forty-five and fifty-five hundred dollars a year. If we look at the last four years in those tournaments that we have hosted, so we are looking at um, helping support that need in the current budget, and then um, probably an increase, which would come to the board, to the co-curricular budget um, to make up for that difference, so they can continue to plan on that revenue and support their programs, because otherwise it is a loss to what they're used to getting within the gift account. Yeah, uh, yes. They, yep. They're rumbling along with 1.3% of our, our budget <laughs> at co-curricular activities now. I hate to have them uh, be punished or be have money taken away yep. from with this change. So I'm make sure that um, they, get, they get enough to send the kids to state. Hopefully we'll be sending more and more to state. 
Well, the state budget is actually a separate budget, so that's still there, Gary. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, Tom. Completely unrelated, somewhat. <laughs> I heard in the news last night they were having some trouble with getting referees for games with one player. I mean, why would that be a problem? Do you know? I, I think with officials, what we're seeing is a lot of our officials are of an older age and they are retiring. And you don't see a lot of young people going into uh, that, that work. It's not an easy job uh, as you do take a little bit of grief at some games as being an <laughs> yeah. official. I didn't know if it was something with the finances that that's a shame that's important. Yeah, I think officials uh, feel like sometimes they're underpaid. Uh, we have uh, increased that in my time being here in the seven years. Uh, officials have seen an increase, um, but still that's a little bit of an issue as well. Um, I, I do have to say that um, this change is uh, a little bit of a challenge for me. I, I uh, have um, strong feelings towards my coaches and my programs, and I think they, they are really excelling at this point, and I certainly don't want to see us be hindered by not having enough money to get them the things that they need in order to be successful. So um, uh, the change um, does not account for as we do more, uh, as we become more successful, it does not um, benefit us right away um, with the current change that we're making. So a little bit of concern there. So just to piggyback on that, we did also talk about reviewing, um, not waiting too many years to review that revenue again. So we looked at the last four full fiscal years um, and with Mark's concerns about, well, if we host more tournaments and there's more revenue coming in, um, not to cap like a $5,000 budget increase if potentially um, the hosting <clears throat> could bring in more money for the gift account as well. So just to review that, you know, a couple of years down the road again and take a look at uh, maybe a bigger picture, more years in that average and, and see if that needs to be considered for an increase. So, And also just to make sure I got it straight and that is that uh, all sporting events, the gates, if it's a regular conference game or match, all those receipts go into the general fund currently? They do. They don't go any, they don't go even get close to the co-curricular activities? They go the into the general fund and all the expenses associated with <coughs> those events are a general fund expense. Yep, that's correct. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I just would make sure, say it again and that is that uh, Co-curricular activity. Did, did you have a uh, by state uh, where those funds are independent of the school district? By state funds are in the gift account. They're also um, at the foundation. They have an account at the foundation as well, but they're um, independent in the sense that it's separated. Um, so our wrestling, human or er, Holman youth wrestling, is that who puts on? It's not just the high school wrestling that puts on by state. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, by state is run through uh, you, uh, the help of youth wrestling and parents, and I believe they're a, um, and I might get this wrong, a 503C or a 403C? I don't actually know if they're a 5013C. A 501, but, yes. Um, they, I think they um, use the foundation in their nonprofit status, and that's why they also have an account at the foundation. But we do uh, receive quite a bit of by state funds and pay officials out of the gift account. Right. But not, so. not all of it goes to the general fund. That's all Fund 21 gift account wrestling. <coughs> the same with um, yeah. show, if the show choir presentation. Show choir is also a Fund 21 gift account. None of the show choir uh, advisor maybe. Advisor cost for that co-curricular contract would be general fund, but everything else is the basically the parent and um, advisor fundraising posted um, revenue from the, those kids so this is mandated by the DPI you say what is this change, this change yes. this change is um, required within DPI language that the board approve profit to go to the gift account it's it's something that's allowed and we wanted to make sure that we we're bringing our process 
up to speed with what's recommended by DPI by getting um, your permission to do so. So if, they, if we recommend this change to, to go forward, um, will it make them? Will it still make them whole? Will, it, will they get the same amount of money as they were before? It doesn't sound like they will. If we increase the budget in the general fund using that average data, historical data, then that'll help support what Mark has been using this money for in the past. And that's, that's what the recommendation is? That's what the recommendation okay. is. Sorry for being so dense. Co-curricular is never whole, I don't think, so that's yeah, why I'm not going to answer right. that. <laughs> I just worry because they, they spend so much correct? time and money raising funds and, and uh, fundraisers and all that to, to keep going and we've got things going so well and we're spending what I'm just guessing but maybe 16 17 million dollars on improving co-curricular facilities in this in this and we still have to scramble to to meet the needs of some of the programs and and we did um, Gary just so you're aware we did increase some staffing this last year in our co-curricular arena so that came comes out of district funds all the staffing and then we also put twenty thousand into the budget this last year for towards co-curriculars. Also, awesome. so that so the we did that this last school year also, <coughs> no, noticing because our programs are growing. Yeah. Um, so we want to support them as much, but as we know, <laughs> we're our programs are growing maybe more rapidly than our budget can keep up with because we only have so much within our revenue limit that we can spend. Yeah, that's, to that's it. my so concern. That's where it gets challenging. That's my concern. The uh, um, I, I appreciate extra money going their way but I want to take good care of them if we can anybody else have any questions yeah I think it's good that they maintain them because I know in that story they were talking about how everyone was going to get the chance for the game and I thought that was kind of sad yeah. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think you're done scared I just think it's really complicated so. well, I, I think our co-curricular programs are really doing a great job of addressing character development and building individuals to be better people and not just better athletes. I think we've made some great strides in the past five years in that area. And I think that's an integral part of what we try to teach kids, whether it's in the classroom or it's on a court or field. Uh, I think that, that we can do a great job of that. And I think co-curriculars really need to be a valued part of the educational system. And that's on the February 25th consent agenda. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. And then Dr. Mueller about the revised 2018-19 school year calendar on tonight's oh, consent agenda. Julie, can you put up the calendar in the board doc for me, the revised calendar? Or I can come over and find it. So um, as many of you are well aware, we've had four inclement weather days already this year. So um, with that, we... Um, and it's the calendar okay, the wrong is one, board just a approved, so um, we're bringing it back for revision. Um, what we're recommending is we had a third day saying that that would be following the last day of the current school year, which was June 5th. So in June, what we are looking at is adding that next day, we would go till June 6th, and then that we had another, we have two days built in. We had the third day, which would go till June 6th, and that was on our calendar already. We had a fourth day, so then we added that on to June 7th, which is just a half day, which used to be on June 5th. Um, we really want to stay within this week as much as mm -hmm. we can because we do have high school summer school starting and other things that come up. Um, I know a lot of people have things planned also, possibly even in those days that we um, now will be having school. <coughs> um, and then also, kind of making the recommendation as we move forward because um, winter is continuing and there could be more inclement weather days in our future um, that just allow the administration to make recommendations because we're going to want to get pretty creative where we, we go off of minutes of instruction now we don't have to do days so um, the DPI is saying you know we're not going we're not in favor of waiving um, instruction is important and we agree as a district our instruction for our students is most up uh, most important along with safety so we would look at if we have more inclement weather days of looking into um, possible other days within our current calendar that we could maybe meet with students and have instruction um, would be our next steps so 
Um, with that, I didn't know if there are any questions. I would like to make a recommendation. That would be to skip the rest of February and all of March. <laughs> sure. And just go right to April 1st if that's possible. <laughs> well, with the way the weather is going. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. So we will be um, putting the updated calendar on our website, and um, this has been communicated with our staff. And as if we get other weather, we will make sure we keep everyone informed on what we will be doing. Thank okay. you. Okay. So for consent agenda, um, we've all been furnished with background materials on each item or we discussed it previously um, anybody want anything pulled out I guess I'm not okay do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda items Tom anybody want to second that second Okay, thank you, um, Gary. I seconded the motion to approve consent agenda, I agenda items as presented. Any discussion? Or do we have any more discussion then? No. Nope. Hearing none, then all those in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda items, as please signify by saying yes. I'll just yes. Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Those opposed, please signify by saying no. No. Gary? No. <laughs> The motion to approve the consent agenda items has passed. Um, I have one announcement from that. We have a retirement I just wanted to recognize. Uh, Christine Muner, she has been a special education teacher at a, our academy on the prairie. Um, she's worked with many of our students and really made a, quite an impact in many of our students' lives in that. Um, she was hired 10 and a half years ago in our district and prior to that time she actually worked in um, Galesville for 30 some years so she's oh been in gosh. education for a long time and mm -hmm. I probably is looking forward to retirement at this point so we thank her so much for all of her um, hard work and dedication to our students really nice. I know her. yeah so. well, thank you um, board members reports and discussion first I will call upon board members in the order of the roll call I would ask you present any comments or committee reports you have Tom I just have a question when is the uh March 18th. March 18th? Monday. Mm -hmm. um, Barb? Nope. I don't have any. Nope. Sydney? None. Nothing. Kate? Nope. Rebecca? I don't have anything either. Anita's absent. Gary? Well, I don't want to spoil a perfect night. So no. Come on. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you think there's snow coming or something and you want to get home? No. Nope. <laughs> Everything under control. <laughs> Um, and then what do I need to do now? Go, are we going into closed session? Kate, mm -hmm. okay, will you take roll to go into closed session? Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. First, I'll read the closed session. Thank Be it you. resolved that the Board of Education hereby moves to adjourn into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851C, considering employment promotion compensation or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, in this case, the district administrator's evaluation. Please answer by saying yes or no. Nobody's paying attention to me, Jay. What are you gonna do about that? Okay, Tom? Yes. Barb? Yes. Myself, yes. Rebecca? Yes. Gary? Yo. Thank you. I've saved. Oh, was there a second? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We'll slow tomorrow morning on your way to school. I'll second it. Thanks for everything you do. 